right, here we go. We have activist and former leader of the Latin Kings, King Tone, in the building. Yeah, yeah, what's up? What's up, y'all? <laughs> well, uh, pleasure to have you. Because um, I remember growing up, I saw the, the documentary that they did on you in HBO uh, years ago. This was in the 90s, I believe, right? Yes, yes, 91. He started, no, he started like 95, 96. 97. It came out 2003. Okay, there we go. There we go. Uh, just a very powerful documentary. As someone that was living on the, the West Coast at the time that really didn't know about the Latin Kings at all, this was before the internet and everything else like that, uh, it was very, uh, just a very eye-opening documentary, and it really showed kind of the complex nature of who you are and your position in that organization. Yeah, you know, in, in any time when you're coming through and uh, you make an oath to be part of something that's... Uh, part revolutionary but part laws because through the historical attacks of of getting labeled as a gang from being a social club or a group in the days that when we started we had to fight that war so you're automatically a criminal is what I'm trying to say when if you took that label or the responsibility to recreate it so you know that that's it's a challenge right it's you know especially when you join something you know that's already has its history Sure. So let's go ahead and get into the whole history of the Latin Kings. So the Latin Kings were originally formed in Chicago in Humboldt Park uh, around 1950. No, I don't. I, I I'm not sure if that's that late, but it, they started around the 60s when the Black Power movement was going, and when they already had in Chicago the college kids going in the street and empowering them. That's where. Young Lords was born out of, and the rest of the power groups were forming there. The Hoovers, the Larrys, we were all, and the Kings were coming up at that time. So I say it's the 60s, really, late 60s after the Vietnam War. They came back, and these were the power groups they started forming to coexist in the Irish neighborhood, you know, that, that you know, being Latino was a tough situation. So that's really when they started, just as a social club around there, the 60s, I believe. Well, originally it started as a group to kind of protect Latinos and to stand up for civil rights. But at one point, it kind of started to have a criminal element to it. Well, you know, I think criminal element in a poor society. So let's say my, for my, my, my example, King Tone wasn't a, didn't, I wasn't born King Tone. King Tone was made and created. And one of the things that created it was East New York. In the 70s and 80s, you couldn't have a nickname named Pachi. So if you Pachi in East New York and you're in the street and you got four sisters, like you said, I, I might have been coming home with a little bit of black eyes. So you start creating what they do in New York. You create a label, you create a character that like, yo, is a lot different being called King Tone than Pachi, you get what I'm saying? Or Tone in the street. So what I'm saying, yeah, and I, I think that's the product and that's, in a poor neighborhood, that's the quickest way a man that's been called a spick in my time, that was the word, not educated, not empowered, you look to these power groups and you look to these people, even though the element is slinging numbers, hustling the numbers with the Italians running to the spot, if it was, you know, the guy in the duck corner slinging dope, a lot of people say, but those are all criminals. Growing up in the 80s and the 70s in East New York, 75th Precinct police officers were selling dope. My guys were selling dope. So what's the environment I'm learning? I'm learning that's the product that gives me a future here. And that's the one they're letting into my neighborhood. So what I'm trying to say is a product that I think, yeah, you know, criminal enterprises or criminal opportunities are offered to me and people like me when we're in those neighborhoods a lot quicker than a real opportunity, like education, equality. So yeah, at an element after they killed our great leaders like Malcolm X and, and Martha Luther Kings, they got mad in Chicago, man. Like they did in the rides in California. Burn this motherfucker down, ain't nobody listening. Now we're the bad guys. So that's what King Tone is unique. I've learned from them in reading as coming up Perception is as good as burning a building as making the city spend money watching me if I'm going to burn it. <laughs> right? It's a, good way to, it's a good way to put it, yeah. Well, at one point, the Latin Kings uh, kind of broke off and there was a lot of different sects in Chicago. 
and then King Gino was the one that started to unite everybody. So that's the history of Chicago, which a lot of it, what is known, is, I learned it like you, reading and, and learning. And that man now is, uh, he's, as I'm seeing and I'm hearing, he's reformed like myself. And he's doing great. And, you know, to speak about him of his past, but I think a lot of people don't understand that a lot of these power groups, like Oscar Lopez, who's just been pardoned and brought home from Chicago, they were all in Vietnam War. Those are people who were drafted. And it was the time after when we started screaming for rights. What I'm trying to say, so we had that element that we went and we fought a war for someone and for somebody who didn't love us, who we fought for, and we came back home and we found out we were still speaks and everything and they wasn't still giving us the opportunity of equality. So when, I guess G and them, because you know when you come from Vietnam, a lot of them came with heroin, heroin addicts and stuff. So the heroes came back with the cancer they gave them in the war. So a new, a new God came up more intelligent, more, more understanding that those things, heroin, those things shouldn't be part of us. And I guess in Chicago, that's when they try to reorganize it from getting lost and, and trying to find our identity to walk this walk and give us, you know, things that are respectable to act like men, not gangbangers. Did you know King Gino at all personally? No, we, I never met him. You know, I know him through uh, legends. He's, he's a hero. He's a... He's a man, and you know, oh, they praise criminals. Who's Trump? Half of this country put a criminal into an office, but then when there's a criminal running a criminal enterprise, they get surprised. Well, right. John F. Kennedy, his father made all his money through bootlegging, which is essentially drug dealing at the time. So, you know, these men, I think these men in that time, and I think you know, you, you're about my age, I'm saying, 60s, 70s, and 80s was a tough time for Latinos, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, because you had the black movement, you had the white, you know, like they say, simple as black and white. God damn it, it's not. There's something in the middle of that. They were called Puerto Ricans, they were called Cubans, they were called Mexicans. And we were trying to find our identity in this city. That's why I love Zulu Nation, because you will see Puerto Rican brothers getting contacted, or Cuban brothers with their black roots. And it gave us this unity to find, but I mean, actually, a Puerto Rican, like Badillo, governor or mayor that ran in the 60s, that Puerto Rican pride was injured, and, and we got abused. And what I'm saying, they fought for that. The Genos, these, these dudes that came back in Chicago, and they seen the young lords, and all of them, as a people, said, we're not taking this shit no more, man. But then in that war, finding out after you fight that war, and you fight, you find out that your greatest enemy isn't the black brother, isn't the, the, the disciples, is the system. They won't let us break this, this, this crazy circle we, we find ourselves in. Because I tried to change it and I fought for it like they did. And you find that my, my greatest enemy was Giuliani and the system saying, a gangbanger can't change. He don't supposed to want to change. And guess what? We're not going to let him change. So some of us choose to stay in a stinking, thinking criminal mind because, come on, some of us become American. We come into that part where what we want is greater than the values. And I'm just saying that who you are is what you got in this, in this country basically a lot. For, and poor kids to compete with an iPhone 11 and they on the bus and they see that your son got it, he's slinging it like it's nothing. And he's like, wow, you know what I'm just saying? We got to compete. And uh, the kings lost their way, but I, I mean in the lost the way where we thought that we had to fulfill the role that the poor community provided us. And sometimes if you explore there like I did myself, you get lost in that world. You know what I'm saying? And you got to find yourself out of there if you want to, you know, have a successful future. Well, King Gino ended up getting... 30 to 60 years for murder. And then um, he was convicted of, I guess, trying to, to run a drug empire behind bars, and they gave him life after that. So at this point, King Gino is going to serve out the rest of his days uh, behind bars, unfortunately. But as you said, I guess he's reformed his ways at this point? Yeah, I think <laughs> if you get sentenced to something like that for a community... Now, like you just said, look what they sentenced Lord Gino to, right? 
for killing and, and, and doing as they've been, they accused him of doing. And he's doing it, and he stood up, and he's paying for what he's done wrong, and he's gone through the programs. They make, they're making him jump through hoops. But I remember when I was in Terra Hut, and I walked the yard with some cats that were involved in bombing the, 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 the World Trade Center the first time. I know of cats that crossed the country that were white in, New, in America, here in New York, that went and fought with the town, brought them out, and 20 years is home. He went out. He fought against us. And because his father had money, he went there 20 years in the feds, and they didn't put him in ADX. They didn't bury that cat. That's patriotic. When you take a cat like that and you show him you never cross us and you bury him. No, a black leader, an Italian leader of a gang, they deserve ADX. They deserve to get 250 years, 24 hours locked down in a box. Because in their own neighborhood, growing up poor, there's a story to every, all of that. And if you look at the walls, all I'm saying to you is, look at the harsh punishments you get because you're called Lord Gino or you're called King Blood. But you don't cut, you don't get it for the for the Sammy the Bulls. You don't get it for them. They get their deals, they get their breaks. So yeah, so like I said again, I don't know his case. I'm younger than him. He's he's, you know, what he's I think he's like me, you know, as a leader. You you take the good with the bad. And you take what you did and you don't. And you shut up and you carry your cross because you fought for your people. And then you repent for the things you did wrong. And you do what he's doing. You face the world and you get better. He's loving his people, his kids. So, I, you know, who he was isn't the man I see today. I see who you, you're not your greatest mistake. I could bet, you know, if I take a picture of your whole life after you commit a stupid crime, I could find shit and say, yo, dude, that was some stupid shit you did. So what I'm saying, some do... Bigger mistakes than other, but I don't know if what they, he did or they accused him is is true. But I know this is true today, that he's a he's a he's a man doing what he's supposed to and living his life. And I just I wish him the best because you know, you know he deserves to walk around, breathe, and have opportunities to love on people. Well, the the Chicago faction of the Latin Kings was known as the largest. You know, I'm from New family. York, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I'm just saying. I, I just, but I, I just think that the, the Chicago history of the of the Latin Kings because it leads into the New York story. Okay, I see what you're saying. All right, all right. You I'm, I'm just I'm, reminding I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I know, I know. Well, well, the well, the Latin Kings in general are rumored to have fifty thousand members. Damn. And the Chicago faction was considered the largest Hispanic street gang in the United States. The largest Hispanic, the largest expat, the, yeah. Ex now it's the MS-13, right, or the 18. Then it was the Crips, right? Then it was the Blood. They took my 50,000 and they gave it to the Bloods. Then they took those 50,000 they gave it to the... You see, because a gang problem is as good as only if it's the problem they're going to say they're going to attack and claim a war against. Before it was a war on drugs. Today is the war on gangs. Tomorrow is what, what's the war, but they never took a war on poverty. They never got the balls to come out here and say, what's making you create these things that you don't come to us who are calling your, ourselves the government and the providers on your worst day, you could come to us and we could give you a better way than the dope dealer. You don't get my point? Shit, to walk through a welfare building and get coupons? Give me a package, sucker, let's go. <laughs> You know, I've interviewed a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of gang members over the years. I've interviewed Crips, Bloods, GDs, BDs, so forth and so forth. And the one thing that seems to be very different about the Latin Kings is the structure of what you guys laid out. You have crews. Crip crews will, will be a shot caller, an OG, and maybe a couple of his homies. Uh, same thing with the Bloods. GDs have, you know, their block but no one's ever answering to a, a higher entity. There's no hierarchy. But the one thing that, that's completely different, it seems, about the Latin Kings is you guys actually set up an organization where there are heads at the top and, and people knew what their position was and people had to answer and so forth. Can you describe how that organization came together from your point of view? 
I thought you were describing Washington or the White House or something. I, I don't know. It sounded like uh, the Senate. But uh, when Martha Luther King marched, he marched with structure and with people who knew what was a nonviolent march. You didn't just walk up in the church and say, oh, we're going to be nonviolent. You had to teach them not to be nonviolent. That takes people and leaders to be called and to teach people how to do things like when hands up, don't shoot. Like I said before, where you were training, when you create these leaders that started movements to look like King Tone, to a gang speaking that, they got to say, we've seen this structure before. We've seen the success it could create. So all they did was duplicate their enemy structure that they used against them to decide, but used it to govern themselves to say, if they're going to say with this, we got morals. We shouldn't do this. We should have the right to, to speak out. We, you know, what's funny is people think that we're some illiterate or we, it's a biker's club. The Hell's Angels, other groups, I'm just saying, it's so, it's so weird when it's, the gang is black or Mexican or something. Like our structure is different from the other ones that they, that's been existent. What's different from ours is that we, there's people who have structures that's following, there's not. There's traditions that are believed, and I think when you take culture and you say the Black Panthers, you see a picture in your mind. You see that there's power behind that name. So when you protect and you build structures, really there was places that we were organized to say this. There's Latin kings here. You're not going to come with your little baton and your little badge and beat the fuck out of us. We're going to fight back here. You're not going to have us in the jail, locked down 23 and 7. You don't give us nothing. No pencils, no nothing. You're going to beat on us. The good guy hits back. Oh, he a gangster now. He hit back now. Oh, he's a gangster. He don't want to get beat no more. He's a gangster. I'm just saying. So structure was a structure, for, like I said before, of any social club. Respect your elders. Listen to the traditions. Like imagine now with, with all those things. Imagine if all those indictments, our elders that knew what they knew before, before us, like the young lords went through COINTEL. Imagine if Martin Luther King and all of them left us guys a roadmap of these things and these these trap artists and, and what a gang would do and false act. You get what I'm saying? Falling into the image that's portrayed to you. But yeah, we had structure because structure is what's demanded in any community. Absolutely. Well, fast forward to the early 80s. There was a Latin king from Chicago named Luis Felipe, a.k.a. King Blood. You knew all you knew you knew you knew all these guys. <laughs> so I guess he had gotten to some trouble in Chicago and he moved to New York. And then once he got to New York, he was convicted of killing his girlfriend. I'm and not he sure. ended up in prison. Uh, huh? Uh, uh, he had a case, he had a murder case in the first He had case. a murder case. Yes. So he ended up in New York. And at that point, he actually created a new set of the Latin Kings. Uh, can you talk about that? No, I, I, what I could talk about, I think you, you mentioned Luis Felipe, who's, uh, he was another man that, uh, he's from Cuba, he's a Marilito. His mother and father uh, never knew them. And when Q, Cuba closed his gate and Fidel Castro sent everybody over, he landed like, you know, for most of the kids, if you see Scarface, it was those times. And uh, he went to Chicago, and I, like, God, Gino, I don't know his Chicago roots or what he's done in Chicago. That, but I, when, I've, when I've heard of, of Luis Felipe, uh, King Blood, he was already a gentleman during that time, that bit. And uh, like I said before, and I teach in Grow Up, Grow Out that later we'll talk about, you are not your greatest mistake. All of these men you mentioned, what they've been charged or what they ran into, dealing with life in a poverty state, or, or sh and nobody makes excuses for, for things we do. Because none of those men, if you go to their case, were disrespectful, none. They were remorseful and they took what they had coming. 
Now, once again, what you're not saying for Luis, Luis Felipe, imagine sitting in the courtroom. Judge Martin is sitting there. Yeah. Billy the Kid did it. All these Western good, oh, Barney and Clyde, there was gangsters in America before the Latin King, folks. You make movies about them cats. You honor them. You played them. So Luis Felipe, because he's a Latin King, and he ain't got the bodies none of these cats had. 145 years, 45 years no human contact, 45 years no phone call, 45 years no mail, 45 years. That's not a draconian sentence when, I, once again, you don't treat traitors like that. What is the signal you're sending to black and Latino Americans and gangs, right? This is what I'm saying. So if he did wrong, and I was there in the trial, and I looked in his eyes, and he took his and he apologized. But they left no room for repentance. They left no room for growth. Then, come on, what, you faking. You get, so what I'm just telling you, Luis Felipe did some mistakes and you leave his, his story where, you know what I teach my youngsters who are walking and getting involved in these power groups? When you're trying to find out who you are because you're already in, and you touched everything and you want to make and be somebody big and you go into the graveyard to find out about dead men's bones and talk about the King Tones, the Lord Genos and all them. Don't disturb the fucking bones because you didn't live through it. You don't know why, who told, who killed, who didn't. All you know is what they tell you in the police report and what the DA stories say. The story is usually told by the victor, not the loser. So I wanted to tell his story. I wanted to say, he is a man. He loved on me. He loved like other men. He, he did. Nobody knew his circumstance. Do I get mad when he make mistake? Hell yeah. Like my mom got mad at me. But I know that if they give him the chance to have someone to educate and re-love him and rebuild him through this process and that he's never coming home, how the saying in that cell, what was the signal? What, what did Judge Martin, the DA, the DA even said, I didn't even ask for that. <laughs> Judge Martin said, no, nah, I did. So I'm just telling you that, imagine the signal is sent to all the people I brought to see that that day, to hear it. Oh, you support them? No, what I'm showing my kids is what they do to you. When you're a king blood and a king tone and you slip and you mess up, what you do is 10 times a sin than a man that walks in with a K-47 somewhere in the fucking suburbs and shoots up a fucking Walmart. Ain't nobody saying shit. Ain't nobody talking about gun rights. Ain't nobody talking who put the gun in Luis Felipe's hands, in Lord Gino's hands. How the fuck he got there? He got a serial number. You could trace it to the motherfucker who sold it. Those dudes we don't talk about. Because like Johnson & Johnson says in this commercial, we take care of you from the cradle to the grave. We poisoned you with our powder, and then we gave you motherfucking dope. What they gave them, they sued them. They get a day, file bankruptcy. Nation still on dope. And, the, and, and we got the president saying he's going to find out where it's at. It's one of your lobbyists, you dirty motherfucker. The pharmaceutical companies, the biggest dope pusher in the United States of America. And you bury King Blood. The little things in life that make you mad. You know who he made mad? Mr. Giuliani, the one over there in Russia. The one over there fucking around being a crook? Huh? Well, this leads me into your story. My story, all right, sorry. When they talk okay. about King Blood, a sinner that's still buried alive, I get emotional. That's my nigga. I love him. And guess what? You want to know something? Never met him. Never touched him. 
Isn't that who Jesus sat with? A bunch of killers and prostitutes and motherfucking no goods? Y'all hypocrites. You hate a crook when he's black and Puerto Rican. You love him when he's white and blonde and rich. And I'm pissed off about it. You lucky ain't 20 years ago. I'll be looking to set something off on Fifth Avenue and, and do like the young laws, just load it with garbage. But you see, that's what I'm trying to tell you for real. The Latin Kings to some was a curse to me, save me. When I was a crackhead, when I was lost, when I gave up on the game, when I was already disgusted. They were my Boy Scouts, they were my Marines. And if you don't understand it, you're not from where I'm from. Well, you grew up in East New York. Yes. East New York, never ran, always walked, you know, right there by Pinkin Avenue, over there. You get up on Euclid, and you there. I was right on the main strip. I'm a strip kid. I'm the avenue guy. I mean, for those that don't know, East New York is a very rough area. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> You know, home of Mike Tyson and, and a lot of other. Uh, so Jay Z lot, was lot, the lot other, other side. Legends. My man Jay Z was the other side. We would call East New York. You have Versailles, you have Tilden Project. You have, you have, you know, you have uh, Cypress Hills that was right down my block. Then you got all that. You know, the the avenues is there. That was a tough neighborhood, tough place to live. Oh yeah, I just interviewed Brian Glaze Gibbs, who who came out of that same area, and he has quite a quite a serious story as well. But you had a very religious mother. She was a born again Christian. Yes, she is to this day. And uh, right, Jesus I guess her. your dad, <laughs> your dad worked for a bakery. Yes, Patagonia. It's in Bed Stuy. It's a whole block bakery. It's pretty amazing. Back in the days when the Italians were Italians, right? <laughs> yep. Well, I, I you went to school. But I guess you didn't actually know how to spell your own name until you were in high school. Yeah. So, it, so you just you, weren't... Oh, sorry, go ahead. In those days, you know, they used to push us forward. But in third grade, I already went through something with a, a, a certain teacher that, I, to this year, Mr. Chodish, I know his name. See that? People have impressions in a young man's life before they know it. He became a great teacher after, even a principal. But when he was with me, it looked like he was still learning because he was pretty much an asshole. And he used to call me names he wasn't supposed to, and he was a bully of some sort. And one day I said, fuck you. I could be a drug dealer instead of be here, be embarrassed by your white ass. You don't even know me. And them days I talk like that because that's how they used to talk. Speak, why? And you got these teachers from Long Island coming and don't want to talk to us and treat us mistreat us. So at third grade, I already was, my mother thought I was in school, but you know, if you have 56 days on count, you could pass those days. So in ninth grade, a teacher asked me, that's when you needed your little homeroom card? And I was on PCP. I was in. I was already all in in the streets at that age. And she noticed there's a problem here. The first person who ever cared enough to ask me, yo, what's up? You got a problem. So I ran, and that's when high school I stopped. You know what I said? So yeah, so uh, I started high school in John, J first my one was John Jay, uh, up on 7th Avenue, down in Red Hook, the high school. I was in the CJ program, they kicked me out, and then I ended up in Frank and K. Lane, East New York, and that's where, basically, you already know, you know, I was already in the streets. After third grade, I was exploring, you know, exploring what makes the world turn in my neighborhood. Well, you mentioned the PCP, you were also doing crack around that time, right? No, no. So when I was younger, uh, crack crack was after the age. And when I was younger, I was pretty much out there slinging like most of us, you know. We wanted our walk this way, the Adidas, the Gazellis, the sheepskin. So we were, you know, we were in the little marijuana. You know, we made our money. And, and at the end, what really happened was we were selling right by our parents, and we transformed, our whole lives transformed. And as much money as I made, I couldn't get over that guilt. My father told me, values are more than money. I'd rather sell bread than be out there like you, looking like that, getting disowned, you get it? And trying to coach me in, but I was too already gone. So I lost my value, so in that misconscience, when I had it all the most, I felt the emptiest, 
I said, let me see what it is to be the other side of this, this coin, the crackhead in the matter, the one that disappears, the one nobody talks to, the one, one I was the dealer, now let me be the crackhead, right? And I want to, because you, you, you let your family down, you let everybody down. You know, a Spanish community and how they were, they were tight-knitted. And when you fall into that, it, would, it really hurt their pride, their Latino pride. So I use drugs to drown out all, all those things that slinging and all that brings. That world brings nothing but sad and sorrow, death. So I made a choice to uh, smoke and then crack was no joke. <laughs> it was base then. You call it crack now because it's the familiar name. Us ballers used to base. Uh, you know, the stick up kids used to base. The cops used to base. <laughs> the room was... The room was full of one and all. Because that time everybody was dirty in East New York. Well, as you're dealing and using, along with that came the prison time. So at what point did you start getting arrested and going to jail and juvenile and, and so forth? Well, I, I, I believe in uh, 89, 86. I had what you call, because I don't call biz just... When I started like staying a little while, but I've been being picked up, brought to the island, let go, ODR from Brooklyn court. But you know, as you keep getting them and you get more severe, then you find yourself in Rockers Island and busing. You get a glimpse of, oh, this is what it looked like. And by then, you, if you're a normal person, that shit should scare the fuck out of you and you don't want to go back over that bridge. But when you're me and you're that kid that already tasted it, and you say, oh, that's the next level to make them believe how mad I am and how ready, how hard I'm ready to go. I ain't scared of what's on the other side of the fence. So in about 80, I think 87, 88, I went as already a couple of, a, 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 a crackhead bus, small shit. Because I already did my big thing. I already did the money, got my, you know, my, my, my paper felony. Now I had like four cases, bullshit cases, slinging out there, doing the bullshit because I'm drugged. I'm in the bullpens in Rockers Island. And you see who's weak, who's strong. You know the story. And there was just Latin kings around already then. And, you know, of course, like I tell my kids, trying to act like what I thought you're supposed to act when you're in a place like that, an old school King pulled me to the side and said, I seen you, you prove, you fire, you're that, but you're stupid. You really don't know what you want, right? He knew. Read this. And when I couldn't read, he said, that's why you mad, because you're stupid. <laughs> and I never heard somebody tell it to me like that. You're just mad because you're stupid. But you, then he gave me the food. You come from great people like Lolita Labron, Oscar. He told me what Puerto Rico was, but my mother and father never took the time because they were so busy. I found an identity in not the kings, in the history of my being told by a Latin king who learned it that way. Some people join these groups because they lost and they want to be found. Some join for protection because they scanned the jail. Some join whatever. I join. Because it was what made me feel right. I read the Bible a hundred times. I was in all, I was in, in Teen Challenge, all that shit. None of that touched me. Like that man's gracious love when I was in my lowest point. And taught me how to read. In five days, I memorized something. Never did that in my life. He didn't hit me. He didn't beat me. He was patient. He taught me how to do it in rhythm. Come on. Black is the knowing of your ancient past. And huh? The ABCs ain't got no fucking rhythm when you match the song to what really sound A makes when you learn to spell. We learn different from that. And he took the time to find out how to make me interested in being smart, reading books. And it sounds like a movie, right? It sounds like Malcolm X and all of them. If you run into the right character like Eri Wells, Mr. Chodish could have been him. In third grade. But that sucker was mad at somebody. Right? He probably wanted to be the next creative son grade and ended up being a teacher in third grade with Spix. So he was mad at me. 
So, yeah, man, in the island, they, they, they took me in. They cleaned me up. My man Sambo, who's a doctor now, who later works with us in Brooklyn Navy Yard. Nobody knows what Brooklyn Navy Yard was like. People talk about Rockers Island. Brooklyn Navy Yard was crazy. So I got a guy that when I walked in, and uh, my man heard it, just to show you, I was cracked up already, my seventh arrest. They sent me to 5J, because I always fought in the island, so they sent me there. And Sambo is there is his name. And I'm gonna use, that's my man. Cop Diesel killed. And he looked at me and said, yo, you're not gonna stay around here like that. You're gonna get a haircut. Then there was an empty bunk next to him. I said, this dude's trying me, man. He said, you're gonna sleep here. Power, rank, understanding of the environment. He's pulling me in. He's saying, you're Puerto Rican. You belong here. If you go there, you're going to get hurt. Look, you look a little fucked up. Let's clean you up. Let's get you ready for what you're in. The gods wasn't going to teach me. Nobody was going to. You get my point? These are men who made an influence on who I was going to become in Rockers Island. A greater criminal or a man that finds himself in an identity to come out in Sambo, King Mafia. These are great people that had an opportunity to hurt me, but help me in my weakest point. So, yeah, that's where I found it. I seen it. I, I studied it. I, I embrace it to this day. I love it. I care for it. I'm relevant. I don't want to be involved. I want to be like you. I want a million young kids in power groups to hear King Tone say you could grow up out of that. They grow up out of the Boy Scouts. They grow up out of college. They grow up out of their gangs. Grow up out of yours. It's all right to grow up out of it. And then let's help those that are going to go through that process. But you as a Latin king and an elder or a blood elder, you a true OG. You still there and you go, ho, oh, oh, ho, come here, son. You walk in the wrong road because we still there to teach like it was supposed to happen in a healthy community. Re-educate us, re-lead us, like the Nipsey Hussles were trying to do, like these men that find salvation try to do in their communities. That's what I found. I didn't want the Kings to be a criminal enterprise. I wanted them to be a movement. Well, you joined the Latin Kings in prison. Mm -hmm. At what point did you and King Blood start to connect? Because you mentioned you never met him in person. So, but you do, uh, you do have some sort of relationship with him. Yeah, we have a relationship, but later on, in that point, I really didn't connect. Uh, and it was just, we knew that why he, he was there and why we united and the oppression that was going in, more than impression, jail power. Because I want to re-educate the power groups with this opportunity too. In jail, it ain't us oppressing each other for the phones or that, that's a sad excuse for the reality of, is the power. The CO doesn't do his job. He gives the phone book to us. He gives everything to us to run while he sits his ass there, and he lets us fight for what he's supposed to take care of. So my point to you is, if we racial profile each other in these institutions as Bloods, Kings, Puerto Ricans, Blacks, that's why one of them suckers could run a unit of 150 of us. And we're the baddest of the baddest. All of a sudden, we become good citizens for them while we chop each other up. And when I go into those cages and see that, that's not what made me tick. My, what made me tick, why are we fighting and why can't the weak eat with the strong? Why can't we make house gangs that support? The, if you've been here the longest, you get on the phone when it's your turn. And as big as you are when you walk in this unit, you wait till it's your turn to have seniority. If not, ain't one of us gonna fight you. All 12 of us is gonna beat the blood out your ass and get out of here because you're not gonna take from a weak person. That's what Latin King's about. That's what Bloods was created for. That's what all this was created for. But we find comfort in hurting something that's easier to attack than the people who's oppressing us into those places and our decisions. So that's what I'm saying there and the island and all that. That's what's going on, really, man. You know what I'm saying? It's well, a miseducation through the, through the... of why we existed or why we fought each other. That shit ain't important no more. The 
purpose that I'm trying to teach you is if we won't race, racial profile each other in the street or in there, you know the difference we can make maybe in two or three years on the next election by doing safe spaces for power groups, doing safe, safe passage for the voters, whatever hood you're from, whatever color you're from. You could well, go vote. You get my point? That's what I want to see in our, our power groups. So I just want to touch on King Blood, you know, before we move on. So in New York, the Latin Kings started to grow as an organization. More and more members, they started to swell. And then right around 1993, uh, an internal war started to break out in the Latin Kings. And... I guess seven people, seven Latin Kings members were, were killed. And there was one murder in particular where a guy was decapitated, set on fire, and his Latin King tattoo was carved off of his body. And his head was never actually even found again. Uh, King Blood was blamed for ordering some of these hits, and he got the most severe sentence since World War II. He was sentenced to 250 yeah. years in prison. Well, then Benedict and, Arnold. And the first 45 years were to be served in solitary confinement. And then 39 other Latin King members got about 20 years each. Do you remember that time? Vaguely, because, you know, I was on probation coming home and working at that time. I was blessed to have the stars blessed me with good leaders when I came home that were running my neighborhood that was a that was well educated and and what it did and and understood the situation where I was in with being homeless coming back from jail not being able to come to my mother's house when I came home they gave me the space I needed to uh to progress and 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 staying home you know what I'm saying so no like most of yous I picked up the paper in the morning, and you see that, and you see people you love and you care for, like what the Christians call for them, the coming of the Messiah, that was the coming of Operation, you know, King Blood and, and taking, so it's like you go and you come and you see people missing. Wives are sleeping three in the morning, and when she turned around, he, you know, he's not there. And I know y'all seeing it as, oh, they're getting indicted in the crime, but I'm saying the human part of what happens when these indictments comes and these accusations. But once again, people must understand, and this is where I'm going, and I don't, it's an old story, but I'm going to make sure people understand this. He was in Attica in a cell with his letters and phone calls being monitored in their prison. Like they killed that rape. I mean, like that rapist killed himself in MCC by mistake and they left alone. He was in a cell. There were people copying his letters. That means there were people copying, keeping, and being accessory to murder. Because if they called one of them suckers, and I don't mean as them suckers because they were the victim or the one committing the crime, but both of them were suckers to the game because they already made a copy of the letter. That's what they accused them, right? So my point to you, I just want to see everybody takes out the, the, the other player in the game. So what they did, let's say if the first thing happened, right? What they did, oh, wow, these guys are real. Let's see if it happens again. But if it was a 16-year-old white girl that got put in that situation you ever done, would there ever been another victim? Would there ever been? I'm just saying, I, I think they sensationalize that guy's murder, which is, God rest his soul, man. And you know, that almighty got him. We Did don't you know. know? Huh? Sorry, sorry I don't know him. I just, like in the papers or anybody you talk in your hood, he's a king or whatever. You call him friend or foe. Like we say, like an indictment, we don't wish that on nobody. That's why we say that couldn't be, and, and that's why we question justice and, 
Was it them? Who Was it really King? So what I'm saying, a man that was in a cell got to get accused for seven murders. So that means seven people, they saying he had to send, right? That's what they accusing him of. So the senders that came and brought him and tickled the tongue of a fucked up man in a civil situation and came out, oh, they made deals with the DA, so that made it righteous. Confusing, confusing shit for a lot of Latin kings and bloods when these things happen. And that's what confused me when I heard the case. And that's why I fought and I wanted and I wanted to pursue justice to see if they were dealing with him fairly and it was blind. Not if I supported or didn't support. That's none of your fucking business. That's like voting. So you could judge me if I support in, re in redemption and making him want to get again. Oh, then you can't be that good because you, you believe. You get what I'm saying? So yeah, I, I think King Blood, it, it, to, to end it there, the sentence is draconian, man. He made a mistake. He apologized. He's been there how long? 98? Yeah. No, but remember, in 89, he was in Attica. That's you. So he's been in a shoe in solitaire since 89. Okay, he's been through the programs. He's doing everything. I don't know what's happening with him. But this, I know I was in the feds. There's a cycle. But he's not getting a release to just have a humanity again, right? And let's see where he's at. Let's let a pastor, let somebody touch him. Let him love on him. Let him give him a hug. Kiss his fucking head. Because if it was your child, you'd be wishing somebody get up in there with him. Regardless what he done. That's how I see him. You get it? And I never met him again. So when he started making contact with me, he's like everybody. Tony, I see you. What's up? You're doing good. I hear you getting shocked. I hear you changing life. You get it? Not every letter was a letter to somebody about like they make a scene. Ignorance, hate. I, it, that's not the king blood I knew. Well, the story goes was that while he was on trial, he gave the blessings for you to be the next leader of the Latin Kings. That was a nice. That's that's a nice gesture, right? <laughs> yeah. Is that true? It's on the court minutes, right? You know about court minutes and all that. Yeah. A lot of questions we ask are answered, and I'm not talking to you, I'm talking for everybody. Many moons ago, yeah, I think that's what he did, and uh, I never shied away from that responsibility. Because if there's a thousand people outside, and then the man that they believed them and they loved and they would go anywhere for just disappeared, the Christians took him. And he named me leader. What I was supposed to do? I had to go down there and fucking lead my community. I had to suck it up while I was the lost and didn't know what I was going to do. I went down. I prayed. And I said, wherever you go, we're going to love you. We're going to remember you. We don't have to do as you did. America got a past too, you know what I mean? Our founding forefathers should be, you could have sent to some of them motherfuckers too. 145 years in, in, in a cell in them days. They were treasonous too against the king. I'm just saying, they killed the indigenous people in America, and I'm not trying to get off group. It's that they make it seem like because the land kings had a past, we can't have a future. America had a past, and they got a future. They call in the people who own this land immigrants and getting away with it. So I'm just saying, the king's been labeled. We know that. We know we've made mistakes. The real kings have taken it, apologized, did our bids, came home, and trying to teach our youth, hey, remember why we really were put into existence. It was not to send you to jail, it was to take you out. It wasn't to make quick money. It was to give the right to make money. And that's what we try. And that's the rebranding I try to teach. Well, 1995, you become the, le the <laughs> leader of the Latin He stays on course, Kings. doesn't he? 
I'm sorry? You stay on course. <laughs> oh, yeah. Of course. Of course. So it's 1995, and you become the leader of the Latin Kings in New York. Now, how old were you at the time? Well, my 30s. In your 30s. That was 97, 96, 97. Okay. And you're known as an Inca? That's a title some that people use, so, you know. We, so, what we, so, I, I like to educate, because you're throwing words around. Incas was a dynasty. They were one of the strongest indigenous peoples. So we just, that's what I was teaching. Rename yourself, rebrand yourself. Learn who they were. Learn what true traditions. Who were their gods? What did they do? But in that sense, that, that's why they used that name for us. It was a prideful name to say he's, he's you know, he's going to help lead us. But there was always more people that I felt as a community, if you learn my movement, was to bring other people on board. Like National, National Congress of Puerto Rican Rights and Perichi Perez, the New Panther Black Panther Movement, the Nation of Islam, National Action Network, the Zulu Nation, the Nietas. That's what the fuck I was about. And not that he wasn't about. His sacrifice just gave me a door and the perfect opportunity alignment where I had an opportunity to lead and to see if we could practice, right? What we preach, what we want, what we really wanted to say. And that's what I think we, that was, yeah, that's what I was trying when I, when I had the power to lead the nation or to give my ultimate advice of the route we should take for a better tomorrow. Well, when you started as leader of the Latin Kings, you wanted to move the organization away from violence and crime. Yeah, everybody does. That's every other immigrant and every gang in America. Like you seen uh, the gangs of uh, of um, uh, the gangs of New York when they were top hats and bow tie. It started criminal enterprise. Then you find your way in America and you get legal and you start learning to live and you make. So I'm just saying, every 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 community and immigrant goes through that evolution. The last law usually is written by the first man who broke it. I've never heard that term before. The well, last I, law is usually written by the first man who broke it. Wouldn't wow. have been a law. <laughs> yeah. No guns now. Well, <laughs> well, you talked about how being the leader of the Latin Kings and announcing that you wanted the organization to move away from crime and violence actually became somewhat dangerous for yourself. You said, uh, now even some of my own people want me out of the way. They think I've gotten soft, and when I'm not worrying about them, I'm worrying about Giuliani's damn police. They're trying to do, do anything to send me back to prison. So what kind of pushback did you get from the organization with this stance? What, it wasn't much because, like everything, once you, uh, once you sit with the Richard Perez, with a uh, with the people who knew about this thing, they started teaching me to watch those around you that become your enemy all of a sudden because they usually co tells, those are the signs of people that have been infiltrated or caught that did something wrong and now are in the process of dealing with they need to give information or take. Of course, like every organization, we thought that evolving and moving on to moving from that would not let us to support those that usually in jail and everything think that's the only economy that somebody, they believe only a crook will take care of crook. You don't get my point? When it's really the opposite, because if you usually find out and you ask every king who gets indicted or arrested, the ones who take care of them are their friends and their family who wasn't in the nation, not because bad, but the nation carries on. So it isn't the crooks and the thieves that take care of you usually after you fall. It's the legit person in your life that always been there. So my point I was telling, imagine if the kings becomes that legit person. So that means we could care for you more in a way in there than us doing it with stinking thinking. And these are the steps and the, the painful steps we will have to take to get there. And some of the thing is growing pain, like you learned, like you said. Is saying things you shouldn't have said or, or being too vibrant, too colorful. Because then ain't now, you know, there wasn't street interrupters, cure violence, all this acceptance of Facebook, the gram. I was new. I was different. 
The message was church, big, loud, proud. Fuck with us, we'll make you mad. You get my point? So that's that's really where, where I was heading with it. <laughs> right, and I think right around that time is when the documentary was starting to get filmed on you, uh, the one for HBO. So here you are, you're the leader of the Latin Kings in New York. You have a little girl who was looked like she was about four or five at the time. Yeah. And you're having these, these meetings, I think, in a church where you have all the Latin kings and they're doing, you know, you're talking about civil rights and you're talking about Latino pride and everyone is, is doing the amor de, amor de rey, you know. Uh, it was really just a very powerful scene that you actually developed there. But at the same time, you were being uh, charged with conspiracy, conspiracy to sell and distribute heroin. Yes. And you watch the, the documentary, and you're originally on house arrest, and the charges are, are, you know, the trial is coming up and so forth. And then at one point, they show a videotape where an undercover cop is recording you secretly, basically in the middle of a drug deal. And at that point, your lawyer said, well, that, that's it. We have to take a plea deal. This is, there's no win with a videotape. Ron Kuby is the name of my lawyer. Good lawyer. Real man stood with me to the end. Always helped me make the best choices that was best to do what justice was going to try to do. To, to do the best what we could do with what justice had planned for me. <laughs> well... Here you are, you have this large, large organization, and you're preaching, you know, no violence, no drug dealing, let's turn this organization around, but you yourself are actually drug dealing during that time. Uh, how do you explain that? Well, I'm not going to explain much, but I'm going to say this, that, that answers your question in a way. So kids will learn, because they got to learn, right? There's a story behind everything. The tape you seen and when you filmed and you all saw that, I used to work on 520. Ron Kuby was on the seventh floor. I was on the ninth for Brian Tim. Before that, if you know it, years ago, I worked for MTV. I've worked, what I'm saying, while I was being indicted, I had jobs. And as I started getting more involved with the Mothers Against Police Brutality and getting really political, but... Losing all those things I gained on parole once I was announced the leader, I lost my apartment. My mother-in-law threw me out. You get it? Who wants the next man on the totem pole? Living with them, around them, around my own children. I was powerless, folks. Listen, still didn't have a license, couldn't drive a car, couldn't vote, was on paper. What I'm trying to show you is Look at the box I, I got in. I was poor. King Tone, with all those kids you see screaming and willing to die for me as much as the movement and anybody else that's their brother. Not because I'm King Tone, they only die for me, but in the movement, go forward. I'm trying to point. I'd rather be broke and do what I always knew to take care of myself than send one of them to rob a bank, to a trap house, to ruin them. That's like I told the judge, Reggie, in front of her. What I learned was, like many of veterans that maybe they, again, a roadmap, are great messengers, that sometimes the message is bigger than the messenger. And the message ain't the bad thing, it's the man. And sometimes the man has needs selfishly or really needs them, but he still does a bad decision. Because if you ask me if I would have made the choice then that I did today, to save my daughters and them to have a place to live, I would have done 15 years in the shelter with them. But my mind at that time, this is real. King Tone asking somebody for fucking money to help me pay the rent? See, this is the side of the gangster you don't want to know. Y'all don't want to betray the broke one, the one's trying to fight thousands of followers. But yet, he broke. He ain't got a caddy. He ain't wearing chains. He's taking the train. 
Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that I really noticed in that documentary is that here you are, supposedly this huge gang leader. And when you when you look at gang leaders, they're usually like the Tony Montanas and the, you know, the Frank Lucases, and, and the, they have minks on and mansions and Rolls Royces. But you were in a really small, dingy apartment with your girl and your daughter. And it, it, it I couldn't really understand it at the time. So... It didn't start like that. I was under investigation for three years. They just, the feds, everywhere I went, there they were. And everywhere they were, we were. And wherever we were, we were thrown out. And who's the one getting thrown out, really? You don't get it? So I, and I had my apartment, I had my thing. But as you have to move every six months, and five cases, miscellaneous cases, bullshit cases, to build their case, to get me out the way. But my point is, it exhausted me. And the judge said it best. This had nothing to do with the kings. It's what you knew what to do when you were broken, what you did, and you went back to your old habit. And that's what I'm sentencing you for. Which leads me to the other things. Land kings don't make nobody do nothing. Motherfuckers join a gang and all of a sudden the gang made me do it. That's the first thing I wanted my judge to understand. This had nothing to do with these cats. None with the messages. She said, I commend you. I see you really were living the life, but you were, you trying to eat the wrong way. You should have asked. You could, you know, all the choices she said I could have had. So yeah, I made a bad choice, damn it. And I stood in front of there and out of all the people they raided and all the money they spent, they got me on a conspiracy to be a look by on trans uh, drugs. Because they know I wasn't out there. Not because I'm better than nobody, but I learned from blood's mistakes and the other mistakes. So we evolved. We grew. Rockers Island lost our power because we were more in the street than we were on the island. That's a good goal. I'm proud of that. Fuck, I want my gang to run the Rockers Island when we could run the, we could be in the streets getting entrepreneurs, barbershops, haircuts, tattoo machines, do the Grito de Reyes, a newspaper. We had it all popping. Empowering the people. Getting involved with the mothers against police. So that's what, you know, I always go back because that's the original me. You get it? And that's who I was. But when you make a choice and you put in a tight spot, and you know, people who had choices, they always think there is choices. Sometimes you put in that moment where you got to decide now, and like I said before, welfare's money to save my family from getting evicted takes six months. I regret. A lot of people, oh, I don't regret. I'm a gangster. So Maybe who is? No. I regret those moments. I'm just proud that I learned from them. I would regret if I didn't learn from my mistakes. You get what I'm saying? So that was a mistake I would do if at that moment, if I needed that to save what I was trying to save, I would have made a better choice. Well, you got sentenced to 13 years. Yeah, wow, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I actually cried watching your mother cry when she saw the videotape and the lawyer told her that he's going to have to do this time. And then I watched your little girl walk out of the, the building crying. That seems like probably the hardest part that came with that. I guess it was a plea deal at that point? Yeah. Me and Kobe, we plead. We took uh, 13 and a half to 151. And uh, I waited till all my co-defendants were finished. So I sat in MCC New York, extra in the hole, so nobody could say my plea would affect their, their cases. I'm an old timer to this shit. My name ain't 6 9 this ain't a phase. This ain't something you play. And you don't got to look to be a gangster. You don't got to look what you portray as a gangster. That's the first thing you got fucked up. We got to be, look at me. I'm pigeon toe, flat feet. I, half of these dudes kick my ass on a one-on-one. -on -one. Well, well, in the documentary, I remember when you were uh, speaking in front of a uh, Latin Kings uh, crowd, you said that they offered for you to tell against your enemies and they would carve up your time. You know, they're like, you don't have to tell against your friends, but if you tell against your enemies, we'll, we'll make your time go away. And you said, no, I'm not doing that. 
So lesson number two, my power groups out there. This ain't new to them. They've been doing this since the 60s. They're professional. The FBI will only go in in the doors you open for them. A choice you make that's a little choice to you could hurt you later. Why I'm saying this is the FBI operates different. They come at you with an investigation that you don't understand. Conspiracy wasn't made for Spanish and black kids hustling. They're really not organized. Shit, a Lion King couldn't get on time in a place and where you tell them? You don't get it. it. They make it organized to fit the RICO Act. But we were, why they never mentioned money, 130 of us, and all that they caught? Why they never, because we were poor. They didn't want, they wanted people to have still the glamour. They're powerful. They're scary. They got a lot of money. It's not the image, man. And, and if power groups start understanding, stop living up to the hype. Let's step back a moment. Let's teach these youngsters. That's why our streets are a little wild right now. We're suffering from this gunplay. And elders like me haven't stepped up to the bat and say it's okay to squash some of this shit from the 60s. Some of the hurts that I left you behind. I fucked up. I did a drug deal. I hurt the movement. I hurt the Mothers Against Brutality. I hurt Richie Perez. I hurt all my friends with that choice. I did three years in solitude to confinement and thinking about that day my whole three years. The greatest thing I could tell them is I learned from it. And I came in here. And I, and I mastered and found out to really be on point. And situations shouldn't dictate the choice that you make to be the same one when you know where it's going to lead. So drug dealing doesn't enter my mind no more. You get it? It's not an option. When a motherfucker like you bumps me in the Walmart and doesn't recognize that I had a hard day and I'm King Tone and I want to smash your ass, I remember myself. Freedom is not overrated. <laughs> Dig that shit, nigga. <laughs> Excuse me, so sorry. <laughs> you get it? I've learned that. Well, you were sent to Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. Yeah, that's a nice place. Comfy. And for the first three years, you were in solitary. Yeah. What does three years in solitary do to a human being? You did an interview. Someone explained. He was saying he went crazy. He cried. You do all that, you know. Yeah, I think Michael, Michael Franzese. Uh, I spent eight years in prison, 29 months and seven days in the hole. I was in solitary for almost three years. Yeah, they kept me in lockdown. And I got to tell you, that's not easy. You know, regardless of what anybody says, we weren't meant to be solo. We were meant to be social. Yeah, we, were, you know, we, we did a little research because I really never watched none of you. So my man Landon was like, yo, Tone, listen to one of them. I said, nah, then I'm going to feel like I know, dude. <laughs> but anyway, I, yeah. I heard that one. And it, he described what happens. See that? I already was in the state. I'm a king. I'm King Tone, right? And now they put you in there, right? So the mirror's in there. Your toilet's in there, and you're fucking bunked. So you one day, just as much as you're going to shit, you're going to have to look in that mirror, sucker. You could sleep for six days, 32 days. One day, because they're not open the door, you're going to go over the sink and look in the mirror, and you're going to say, are you still King Tone? Are you still that nigga? And a lot of dudes never practice doing nothing. The weed keep you talking shit, doing it, in the move, in the street. Then you kick that whole thing. You know what I was kicking? I was kicking TV, radio, sex, life, power. Officer Schwartz, Volpe's co-defendant that they just let loose in New York. If you know the case, the Louima case where they put the plunger in MCC New York, I used to watch him pace, crying that he was going to hang himself. New York City finest. Get caught with their underwear down. Now you pacing and going to kill yourself. Why ain't you the same guy you was in the bathroom, sucker? That's where you meet cowards. Because the judge, or turn a man into, wanted to be a homosexual. The judge, when he hits the hammer, He'll change a king tone into a lawyer. When he hits the hammer, he'll turn a young man into a gangster. 
Because when you walk into a living worth, you better know who you are. And you better know what you did. And you better know who you did it to. So my point, when I walked in and they put me in the shoe, I already knew I was King Tone. I just didn't know what I was going to do with him. And solitude could, could make you fall apart, eat your own feces, take a light bulb, break it, shove it in your eye and pull it out. There's nothing. I, it could make officers drop a bomb in your cell because you put toilet paper and they can't count you. Uh, a sound grenade bomb in a 6x12, then it blows up, it blows you. You don't know what you don't know what force feeding is. Americans worry about waterboarding across the ocean when there's more than 50 men every night in federal penitentiary penitentiaries being tortured in the shoe. But that's all right. They gangsters. They deserve that treatment. So I'm just Livingworth showed me that, and it didn't break me. It like I this Latin. So Livingworth was exciting. They put me in the dog pound. The dog pound is 60 years high, about 40 deep, old school jail, two bunkies. And if you get off the bed, the bunkie, the, you know. You know what's the first thing, really, even as King Tone, as a veteran that I'd been to some bids, that I told myself, what the fuck did you do to be here? <laughs> you remember? I ain't supposed to be here. Yeah, I remember when I interviewed Danny Trejo, the actor. And this may be the interview that, that you're talking about. But he said, you know, and he was a career criminal in and out of prisons and so forth. And he said he ended up in solitary confinement at one point for, uh, I guess, attempted murder of a, of a CO during a riot. And he said when he ended up in there, inside of the, his solitary confinement cell, it said, God is shit in feces on the wall. And he said at that point, that's when he just looked at his whole life. He looked in the mirror and he said, okay, what am I doing with my life to end up in this room right now? Well, well, in Soledad, there was a riot yeah. that happened. That was and the changing spot in my life. Well, you ended up stabbing a guard. Uh, no, I, uh, no, you didn't. It was alleged a that wedge. I threw a rock and, and Lieutenant Hick Gibbons got hit in the head and Ray Pacheco hit a... Uh, Kicked the, he socked a free person gas chamber. Henry Quijada kicked a, 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 a coach uh, gas chamber. Rock gas chamber. So we were sitting in the hole and kind of, kind of feeling that we're done. And somebody had gotten uh, uh, shit and smeared it on the on the wall, and they put God sucks. In the in a hole, and I'm looking at this, and I'm sitting in this hole, and I remember thinking, this is what my life has has come to. Yeah, and I have to completely change my life. You know, now. there, just so you know, so the, what made me get through it. You know, I I learned to one make a schedule, but the mirror has to be a daily event. Talk to myself, remind myself what I wanted to do, and that's where I started creating in my mind, so with Dave Brotherton from John Jay College and Lewis Bodies who were part of that church movement, they say, why don't you do something interesting, Tony? You're very, why don't you start studying the shoe and telling us what it's like and what it looks like? Why don't you start figuring out what you wanna do when you get out? You see, feeding me that hope, in those three years I articulated my program, Grow Up, Grow Out, Safe Spaces for Power Groups. Forms and formalities that when I got in the street that I could remarket myself and sell myself to the community I let down, and apologize, and maybe find a voice and a place for us returning citizens at the table to maybe correct some of our wrongs with intervention. So the shoe really built me. And I don't, look, suckers, I could have done that home. I could have done it in a closet. I could have did it in the altar with some, some pastor with his hand on my head, the Holy Spirit. I could have done it anywhere. But for me, it took that shakeup and and for conspiracy to be a lookout to a drug sale, Tony, you know you didn't really, you wasn't a drug dealer. You needed money, one shot, you blew. They sold you out. And uh, all powerful groups got to remember, usually the ones that are in the court telling on you ain't the ones you were shooting at. Usually your friends. Well, 
you end up doing three years in solitary, and then they let you into general population. How much time did you end up doing all together? I did, uh, I think, nine and 18 months. So I did Livingworth. So what really happened, so make it short, from Livingworth, they kept flying me every three to four months. I went to Terre Haute. I went to Lewisburg. I've been to Oklahoma. I've been to Estelle. So they flew me and they kept me. I, I done stops and met people. But in 2003, I finally made a compound in USP Polop in Louisiana. And uh, I got the opportunity to walk the yard and, and now practice after three years being human again, learning what, what, you know, what it feels like to be around people. And uh, in 2003, 2000, I think, six or seven, they, they finally gave me the permission to go down to an FCI Estelle, which means lower security. And I breathed because 12 and a half years in a penitentiary with 1,500 men. 78% of them got life sentences. And I got a date. And I'm the leader, so-called, of a gang. Ain't nothing scarier than that. So all the door, I'm living, you got a date, and you're in walking the pen, and you you an idol, and you're reverence, and you got juice, and you're trying to go home in 12 years, you better be get real articulate and know who you are if you're going to make it to that door. So I started strategizing those three years that I planned my safe space and power groups. I started doing it in prison yards. And the warden used to get mad. He says, how the fuck you find the spot I stand in and know what's going on and you keep it safe? And you get it? Because I knew what everybody in the yard was looking for. And I was the guy they trusted where I could have treaties with them and make the best decision for the whole yard instead of a, a dope, bad, gone deal or this where we could, we could fix it. And to show you humanity in a USP. If somebody cares to be the reverend, to go outside and really talk to him, say, hey, why don't we run things this way? How did it feel to walk out of that cell <laughs> and, and into the real world? It was fucking funny. So what do you mean, the outside world or the, the shoe to regular pop? No, when you finally finish your prison sentence. <sighs> Saddest day of my life, one of them. I got my parents alive. You know, and everybody I love, thank God, they're really close. So I don't know what that experience is. But it's the moment leaving there. So you do 13 years. And you meet people with 30 years, 40 years. People with hope. Old timers that when they hear you got a date, start filling your body with hope and dreams and what they would do if they would go home. Sometimes they get exhausted and they get tired. But they, they you know what I mean. You're a dream. You're going home. So what I'm saying through all those years, the people that helped me, Oscar Lopez, when I was in Terra Hut, and they, they wanted, and I was in beef, he stood by my side. And these ain't kings. These were people from the community who saw the video and said, besides we're GD, whatever, y'all ain't fucking with Tom. <laughs> he a peacemaker. You get it? He's about what he says this time. And they sent me home from uh, Ohio. And uh, Ohio, I walked out. And I remember about 200 people on the fence. And they hold it tight. And they made me want to come back. Ain't that some shit? I was ready to tell freedom, fuck you, I can't leave them behind. There's some good people that done their bid, deserve to be home, that communities have forgotten about. And I feel guilty for leaving. Because as a gangster, as a leader, as King Tone, as Pachi, some things I, I shouldn't be here for. That's not your business, the DA's business, nobody's business. But some of them guys deserve to be home with me. So at the end of the day, that's how it feels. It feels like you want to be free, but you want to stay loyal, and you want to stay with the people who loved you, while your family, your friends, everybody else forgot you. So King Tom with 7,000 followers came home without a toothbrush, without sneakers, without a bag, without a, the movie's version of a Cadillac and 12, 15 kings in the front screaming with the Hennessy. That shit didn't go down, son. I had a wife who I never knew, who believed in me, picked me up, and said, your new beginning has started today. And here I stand today. So the first day was unique. 
I left my best friends behind and I came to the new world and I accepted it for what it is. And I used my, uh, my experience and the last look of my buddies who told me, Tone, if anybody who came through this system ain't coming back, it better be you. <laughs> I took the warning real seriously. So I'm trying real hard to today with friends like Clinton Lacey and the people who surround me today. Uh, I've been pretty uh, blessed to be free till today since 2009. Okay, so you get out and you actually focus your life on helping people who are still incarcerated and coming out of the system from your position and from your experience. How is that whole experience like? It's amazing. It's uh... So real quickly, I, I now have a for-profit called Grow Up, Grow Out. And what we believe, what I learned through my walk in this life was oppression leads to aggression that leads to violence. And everybody used to try to help Tone either when he was oppressed or he already was violent. So I had to come up with an equation, a vaccine of how I could penetrate and heal. So real quickly, I found out if you listen to the oppression, self-inflicted, uh, imaginary sick, or just criminal thinking, once you listen, you find out the person you're trying to help, aggression goes down. He's been listened to. He's been heard. And when the aggression goes down, I believe it's the only teaching moment to avoid violence. So there you become a prevention of violence or give information and choices that if he does son, it would be something less than violent. Make sense? Because we're dealing with the oppression. So uh, I put that into practice in New York. When I, 2009, I convinced my wife at 2013 when I got off parole. I've been on parole since 86. 2013, I signed, and it was the first time that Antonio Fernandez was ever free from a system. And I, my wife, who's held me down, got a great job. I said, we got to go to New York. She said, why? I said, Virginia won't even let me work in Walmart. These people want to put me in a program dressed to impress and teach me how to dress, and I did 13 years. I know how to dress, stupid. You get my point? There was really nothing waiting for me but her love, but nobody would hire me. So I left to New York with her, and we moved to New Jersey. And I went and I started a program in the corner of Pennsylvania and uh, Atlantic, right where I was raised, and I caused the most harm. I did it for a year. Then I started a program called Hotspot in Newark, New Jersey. And I did that for nine months. Then I came back to D.C. where I... Someone that I heard of and knew about named Clinton Lacey that works for the youth uh, Department for Youth and Rehabilitation Services, Clint Lacey, who got this credible messenger story, and I got safe space, and we put it together. And now, I work in a youth facility, two of them. I got seven returning citizens from 8 in the morning to 3.30 in the morning in the jail, walking with keys, and they open doors. And when that kid feels depression, thinks he got to kill himself, hurt himself, there's a credible messenger with a credible messenger to tell him, that too will pass, homie. Don't worry. You could finish these 20. We did it. And don't believe telling is going to heal you. Don't believe this. What's going to heal you is you empathetic. You take charge of what you did. You make amends with yourself and God. And let's go face this together. And we do that in a youth facility with 36 kids and uh, 16 are, are, are charged as adults. We got all our girls in the community. And that's what I do now. I open prison doors for our young adults to not be persecuted and treated, mistreated because they're young until we tear down every youth facility in this country. But we got to start from the inside. We got to re-educate re the system, reheal it with the credible messenger so we could come to an understanding with the community. The only way we heal this gun problem is with the community, not with the justice system, through restorative justice and with guys like me who come home to fix shit we broke. I interview a lot of people on Vlad TV. And one of the most, I think, shocking things that I ever heard when, when interviewing former gang members 
came from when I first interviewed Mr. Capone, who was uh, a Sereno, uh gang member. And what he told me is when he was younger, his goal in life was to do life in prison and to be a kingpin calling the shots from behind the wall. For, uh, for me, someone, yeah. someone like me, you know, what I learned at the end of the day, you go to jail, you realize like, I mean, jail ain't, you know, jail, as a kid growing up, jail was like a victory. Like, yeah. you get a prize. Like, I kind of wanted to be in jail. Like, my dreams, like, it even sounds crazy as hell, but my dreams were like, I want to be doing life in prison. As a 17-year-old kid, you dreamed, I dreamed to that. have life in prison. I dreamed that. And to be, like, a, a high-ranking member calling shots from I mean, your jail cell. When you're a kid, I was, I, I was loving violence i was loving the streets i was loving the power i was gaining power because i was not just the average i was actually out there putting in work so i would see the power and i was enjoying the power when you hear this out loud it sounds like absolute craziness but you're dealing with kids who look up to king tone and say man fuck what you talking about i'm trying to be what you were i want to have a thousand people cheering my name and be a shot caller and, and, and be a, you know, be a big boss. I don't care about all this other bullshit you're talking about right now. What do you tell someone like that? And listen, I'm not, I'm, it's the perfect example for a moment, right? When you die, you could be honored like Nipsey Hussle. Or in your community, you could remember like 6 9 Now, people think I'm comparing the two because one told. That's not why I'm mad at him. I'm mad at him for a long time. He knew who he wasn't. He knew what he didn't want to do. But that capitalistic pig in us of wanting and a lot of likes and a lot of hits. I never talk about the kid. So what I'm trying to tell him is this, like I did. The Latin Kings, when I joined them, I joined them. I learned, I read, I understood it. And not that it gives them the right to abuse me, because I believe if you, this ain't for you and Islam is, kings should let you go, be in, go join Islam. If you want to be a Christian, give them gold gates, let them go. So my point is, that that leaves don't, if you're real about what you say, that what leaves don't make you weaker, it makes you stronger. You don't got to kill a nigga that want to leave. Huh? Go! You saving me for two real dudes who are doing this and ever. So what I'm saying, if you're going to get in this life, everything ain't leading 7,000. Everything ain't in glory. Like I said, I was broke. I couldn't get an apartment. The feds was always looking at me. Don't ever think they're not. Even though I was trying to do good. So if you play the role, sometimes we play the role long enough till we become it. So what I'm saying, I wasn't King Tone the idol till I made him. Then sometimes the idol becomes bigger than Antonio Fernandez. And then you got to face your idol in the face and say, I made you. And I'm going to destroy you. Not the feds, not snitching, me and you handling this one-on-one. -on -one. The kings didn't do it to you, Tone. Your mother didn't do it to you. Poverty didn't do it to you. You liked the money and you liked the power. And then you like to be an activist. So be King Tone and do your fucking bid. Take charge of it. Accept your wrong. And go in there and come home so you don't got to hide from your community. Your family doesn't got to get replaced. That's what I hate about snitching. They confuse snitching with repentance. They're not the same thing. So the DA sells to the community. People tell because they change. No, people tell because you make a deal, Justice. You're not blind no more. You lifted up the fucking blindfold and you cut a deal. Jesus never cut a deal with the de devil when he told him, bow down to me, when he went to him three times. So how the fuck does justice in America make deals with crooks? So that's my point. And that's what I tell him. When you get in this, you made a choice. When you come back, we'll love you. If you end up like blood, unfortunately, where we got to try to dig them out, or you change your life with a 30-day bid. But this, not that the Kings isn't the life for you. 
The life for you ain't the kings to the king recognize and find who they are. So when you do come to us, our leaders have moved forward and we know how to, as power groups, support one each other in these communities and not fight each other so we could win back what we've lost, our freedoms. Well, you fast forward to December 6th, 2019, which is today. When you do a, a search for the Latin Kings in terms of news articles, uh -huh. uh, 62 members of the Latin Kings are facing charges in the largest takedown in Boston's FBI history, uh, where they found automatic weapons, uh, tons of cash, I think some missing children were, were found along the way. The Latin Kings are still being portrayed and seem to still be involved as a criminal organization. Number one, do you yourself still consider yourself a Latin king? Yes, I do. I do today when I'm ashamed and I'm embarrassed that you got the right to fucking tell me something like this. It hurts my movement and many other kings that work in hot dog trucks, barbershops, babysit, land queens when they choose this economy over, and I ain't judging them. So you wanna know what I think? So just the world know, this is King Tone's Facebook, Antonio Fernandez. So I heard yesterday and it broke my heart. And I wrote, good morning my people. Last night I got a call. They tell me of the big sweep in Boston Mass. I started reading. My heart was going 100 miles a minute. I was taken back to 1998's raid done to our nation in New York. I tell the brothers, let's pray that the Almighty keeps them, keeps the misled from falling into life sentences. He said, fuck that tone. I ain't praying for people who are out there to hurt our traditions and our people. I still prayed. I don't wish this on any of my friends or foes. We must do better than this, my people. We must not let our wants overcome our values. When we see money and power over truth <laughs> and brotherhood, it leads to us hurting the nation's growth for years to come. Out of the group, some will break and help bring other groups in. The feds win. Now if we learn from the old saying, everything that shines is not gold. Tested by fire to see if it's real. And I learned from my mistakes, hope they learn from theirs. A great leader, if you follow the roadmap, shows they were greater followers. Never forget a leader never gets power. He takes it by force or favor, if not chosen by the people. Choose the way you grow in the crown. Almighty help us grow from all this. Have a blessed day. That's what I told 5,000 people today. Because if I'm going to talk about a dirty cop, a killer cop shooting my kid down, I'm going to talk to the brothers that are misleading my youth to think that this is being a Latin king. That's what I got to say to them. Yeah, I mean, I feel when you look at these groups, like the Latin kings, the Crips, the Bloods, the GDs, the BDs, whoever else, when you look at U.S. history, the founding fathers would have been labeled a gang if they had lost that war. Those would have been the criminals. Those would have been the, the gangsters, the ones who, were, who got 100 years, who got hanged in front of a, you know, a, a crowd of cheering, you know, cheering people that they're gone now. And this would be England right now. And I've been to England. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we replicate them. You see where we came from. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that people like yourself that are trying to take these gangs and move them into a direction of empowerment, of voting. You know, for example, if you look at U.S. history, 
the reason why the stereotypical police chief is like Sergeant O'Nally is because the Irish at one point were the underclass and they got together and said, you know, we're tired of this. We're going to vote ourselves in. That's why we're going to put ourselves in public office. We're going to put ourselves as the chief of police and the mayors and so forth. The Jews took and over the education department, the legal department. Then the, our, our Irish friends, you know, everybody found their place. Yeah. The, all the laws in New York City was built by the first gangs that owned it. Exactly. And I think if that a lot of these gangs were to listen to King Tone and see the future of what they can become as opposed to what they are right now, you'd have a much different uh, landscape in America. You know, my friend Scarface, the gangster rapper, the former drug dealer, is now running for public office in Houston, as well as I my friend Scarface. Willie D. Scarface, I've been listening to him my whole life. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. So it just shows that these former gangsters could come back and use their following and use the love of the people to actually make a difference in the political climate of America. And I just wish the best for you, man. I, I appreciate the platform. And I just wanted to say this to the, the guys, you know, we got to evolve. We got to move forward. This violence against each other in Chicago and these main cities, the reason they want that crime is we're going to lose them and and we'll lose another race and another opportunity to empower our people to go and let's get right. Let's get our communities right. So you get what I'm saying? So I'm against that violence not because, you know what, I see humanity. I don't see Crips, Bloods, and Kings no more. I can't hurt a cow no more. I was killing animals when I came home and I got on my knees and said, yo, God, if I'm going to kill a cow and a sheep, <laughs> I'll go find Giuliani. I told him, get me out of this. I don't want to hurt nothing no more. You get it? So that's why I'm mad. And I'm not perfect, but I'm a lot better than the kid who knew to sling dope to solve a situation. Now the credible messengers, that's why we call it credible messenger. Our messages are now credible. We just don't got one. So thank you for our platform. Listen out for that. And I hope to God that those brothers, they got picked up, you know, that, like I said, that the Lord protect them and that they learn from the situation like everybody will learn and that they, they get home safe. Well, King Tone, I appreciate you uh, sharing your story. Uh, it's a very powerful story. It's a story of redemption, and it's a story of turning yourself around because statistically you should be in a cell right now for the rest of your life. But instead, you're out here actually spreading a message and changing lives, and I think that's very important. All right. Thank you, brother. Good to see you. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Absolutely. The best of, to you and your family. All right. Thank you.